<laughs> I have I have a 200 hour screaming only rule for you. <laughs> I'm in. Hey, that was really good, Chris. Could you read that one more time? Except this time I need you to go down on. <laughs> Scratch that. Bro sampled it and played it back like a dubstep song every time he was trying to play me in. And it gets people to like squirm because they they hate it. So I'll be like. Now, coverage like no other. Bringing you videos from the event floor. You're watching convention coverage. Studio people are like, I need this mic. Where's the mic? Get on mic. And you're like, does that happen to you? Or are you used to it? Uh, I, I'm used to it because I, I try to take the context clues, but sometimes they do it on purpose. <laughs> does anyone ever do this? Like, you okay? Is everything good? Are you good? Sometimes. It's just a mic Aww. check. Oh my God. <laughs> Get you start out. giving your life story, mic telling what your problems for the life mic are that day, check. and they're like, no, it's just a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. It's our pleasure. Thank of course. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Y'all deserve a round of applause. Um, so. Hey, I'm Mike McFarland. Uh, I am Roshi and Yajrobi and a few others in Dragon Ball. And in One Piece, I am the ADR voice director. I'm also Buggy. And I took over for Helmetpo when Troy Baker started doing all the video games in the world. Um, <laughs> and I do several other things uh, with those uh, particular franchises, but that's the bulk of it. So awesome. And then we have so many people who've done other things with these things. Oh, we're going to start from over here. Okay. Sure. Hi, I'm Caitlin Barr. I did uh, ADR scripts for the English dub of One Piece for yeah. a really long time. Yep. Like from the time skip up through Zo, I think. That's so many, ep that's so many episodes. That's so much. How, how many like, episodes like does that show up to now? Show. The show uh -oh. in sub is up to over a thousand, by the way. Yeah. I also voice Baby Five. She Baby. I'm Baby. Five. five. <laughs> the fifth five. one. Uh, my name is John Swayze, and uh, I play um, uh, Sir Crocodile in uh, One Piece, <laughs> That's right. as well as, uh, uh, is it Gandalf? That's yeah, from Lord Gunfall. of the Rings. Gonfall, not Gandalf, right. Gonfall. <laughs> That's, yeah, Lord of the Rings. Wait, what wizard are you you shall about? not pass. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I uh, played Dodoria and a couple other things in Dragon Ball. Uh, hi, I'm Chuck Huber. I play Android 17 and Emperor Pilaf in uh, the, the DBZ uh, franchise. In One Piece, I'm Lion Tamer Moji, and I was in the Frankie family. Uh, I was just named Silver Hair because I had silver hair. It's valid. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rai. I hope everybody's doing good. Sorry, this is my first panel, my first con, so I'm a little excited. What? Really? Yeah. yeah. Right on. So, um, well begun. Thank you. Thank you. Well begun is half done. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I have only been in one piece. I did a bunch of people who both screamed and also shouted and probably died, but I also played Pico, the Don Quixote family, who has the most manly voice in the entire show. <laughs> and I have not been in Dragon Ball, but I am here and I'm for it. Hi there, my name's Chris Guerrero in One Piece. I'm Gekko Moria, Hyruden, and Peckhams in Dragon Ball Super. I am Lavender, part of the Trio de Danger Brother group. Yeah. 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 Well, definitely, so once there. again, welcome to the show. I'm yeah. so happy to have you. Rye, our first show? Really? Yeah. yeah. First one ever. Right on. Well, thank you for choosing us. We appreciate it. Hey, yours. everybody, no worries. Rye's got this one. We can sit down. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'll solo this 100%. Right, totally. <laughs> I love the company. I know everything about Dragon Ball and One Piece. Dragon Piece. Drag yeah, Dragon Piece. That's the dragon show, right? One ball. One ball. Whoa, hey, family show. No, we got to find the Dragon Piece. <laughs> the Dragon right. Piece. Dragon Piece to make the one ball. Exactly. Yeah. One ball to rule them all. <laughs> one piece of Dragon Ball is all you need. Yeah. Caitlin, you said you would have to help do all of the, the writing of the scripts for... Uh, how, dub. So, yeah, uh, how many pirates? Up to double many? A, double K, double, double L? Uh, we have hit double W. Double, double w. w. So that's how many extra characters. And as a writer, that's really, really hard mm -hmm. to figure out who's saying all those things. If wow. anybody doesn't know what I mean by um, ADR writer, I don't write the story. Um, I, I'm not Oda. I oh, wish Oda. I was Oda. <laughs> Wait, you're telling me you're not Oda? I mean, we don't know what he looks like, so... No, I thought we did. You could be. So you could be Oda. Yeah, you don't know. You've never seen me and Oda in the same place. <laughs> never, no once. Yeah. Anyway, um, my job, and some of us on this panel have also done this job. Mike's done it, Chuck's done this 
job. Um, ADR writer is when you take the Japanese episode of an anime or any you know piece of media that needs to be made in another language, um, and you uh, take the translation and rewrite it into dialogue that fits what we call the flaps, which are the movements of the character's mouth on screen. Not only does it need to fit the flaps, it needs to be you know, an accurate adaptation of what was being said in the original, and it needs to bring across the intent of the original, but also be accessible to an English-speaking audience. You know, If there's a joke in Japanese at that part, and you're, it's supposed to get a laugh, then you want to get a laugh in English as well, even if you have to completely reimagine the joke. Um, so that's what I did for many, many years on One Piece and many other shows. That's all, definitely a lot of work. Yeah, that's worth applause. That's not easy. Yeah. And I can tell you, as a as an ADR director, um, it is incredibly uh, valuable to have a really solid script because. If you get a script that needs a lot of rewrites in the studio, that eats up a lot of production time. So if you don't need a lot of rewrites, it makes it move a lot faster and a lot smoother. It's easier to act. Too. It's easier to act. I mean, it, it, it really can be very disjointing when you're having to rewrite every line because it's too short, it's too long. You know, they didn't put pauses where there's pauses or any kind of thing like that. And it just takes up a lot of time and you, and you break up any kind of rhythm that you get into uh, between the director and the actor and the engineer. And, and it just, it's, you know, it's discombobulating. So it's, it's, I mean, and I can tell you, and I know Mike uh, as well, when you get a solid script, I mean, you're just like, when actors come in, they're like, okay, so this is a solid script, and it's like just at a nice, even pace. Don't go too fast, you know, because it's written like this. And they just, they, they nail it, and it just, it's so rewarding. And, it, and then it makes it look like, God, this isn't hard at all. Yeah. And it's because the script is so good. So it's, that's, that's vital, of vital importance. So having good writing definitely helps it make it easier for the actor to do oh, their part. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Hi. <laughs> so, um, so my question for all, all of you is: um, do, you, do you have any um, funny or interesting stories that happened to you in your career? <laughs> in the, in the entire career, or just specifically when recording like One Piece or uh, Dragon Ball? Uh, just in your entire career in general. <laughs> um, that's, well, I can start because I got plenty. Um, I. Uh, when I first, my first big role was uh, with uh, David Wald when he used to direct over at Sentai. Uh, it was for a show called To Love Rue. And I spent 80 plus hours working on that show with David Wald. And for those of you who don't know what To Love Rue is, it is, a, it is like the harem slash, et slash etchy anime who uh, Caitlin also stars in as Golden Darkness slash Yami. Um, and that John Swayze here also helped the co-direct and star in as well. Um, it was, uh, that show gets crazy and uh, we had a lot of fun. And so we did a lot of like crazy moments uh, where Rito, the main character, he'd get get very squeaky, take advantage of my uh, my my naturally uh, prepubescent sounding voice, um, and uh, there we'd have times where we just have like five minute laughing breaks after we do a take. Um, I would just be like, I'd like screech like ah! like that. Sorry for everybody's ears, and uh, it would work. It would work. It'd be funny, um, but. In regards to One Piece, when Mike first brought me in for Pika, I had no idea I was doing Pika. I had no idea who Pika was, and uh, I heard his voice, and uh, Mike just said, well, let's see what, what, what happens, and uh, the magic happened from there, and every take was a laugh, because it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, especially with like all those reactions, because sometimes you just get, you get something magical. <laughs> and I'd just like to add... Um, David Wald started directing it, and I'll never forget, because I, I work at Sentai as a director, and he came up to me one day and he goes, John, I've got this kid coming in to read the lead in this show, To Love Rue. His name is Rye, and he is very green, but I can tell you, he is going to be awesome. Just needs a little saddle time in the booth, and so, well, as it turns out, he was right. And, and, and David left, and I took over the, the show and directed seasons two and three and whatever else. And so I worked a lot with Rye. And um, years and years ago, I, uh, 
I saw David Wald in a play and said, hey, you should come over and try this thing called anime. And he said, okay. So uh, I, I got David Wald into anime, and then he in turn basically got discovered Rye and got Rye into it. So I just wanted to point out to everyone that I'm really, really the one to thank for Rye. <laughs> um, because, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to give me I like, got David into it. And, yeah, you know, so. I thought you were going to start like throwing compliments my way and I was going to be like, oh, stop No, it. dude, you you are a magnificent talent. In fact, um, I, was, it, I was thrilled to learn that you're still in Texas. I thought you moved to L.A. No. So um, we, uh, we're doing a show now and um, – one of the actors uh, is, it's very hard on his voice and because there's a lot of yelling and uh, we've had to postpone sessions and, and you know, there's no show worth losing your voice over. So there's, you know, you do have production schedules, but you really try to accommodate because when you're screaming a lot, it just takes its toll. And, but there was actually talk of like, well, if we do have to replace him, who could we get? And everyone in in my little group was just like, Ryan McCann. <laughs> so, uh, but to that end, though, just be careful, man. You're young, so don't be screaming all the time. Oh, I don't. <laughs> when you get older, it will catch up. Is this Rye? Yeah, I hear that you don't get tired of screaming. I, I have I have a 200-hour screaming-only role for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm in. <laughs> this, was, this was about 4,000 cues. And half of them were easily screened. Say less. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but enough about me. Let's have other people talk. Anybody else Does have, anybody have a funny story? I'm no, trying. nothing funny ever happened. When I was at a panel one time, <laughs> Rye, it was his first panel. I almost got a spit take on it. That's all I was trying to do. Close enough. Close enough. Do you have anything, Chris? Funny. Uh, gosh, it's like usually when I'm in the booth, I'm just like, I'm focused on the work. But yeah. uh, I was working on this one show called Termai Romai, and they did a Netflix adaptation of it with better production values, but, and I was on that, thankfully, on that uh, one too, but um, on the first one, it was more like akin to like a low budget, like Adult Swim animation style, like maybe think Aqua Teen Hunger Force. So, we, you know, we were like very loose with the script, kind of taking it on our own, and uh, one of the lines was like, and the premise is about a Roman bathhouse house architect who basically gets almost drowns in the bathhouse gets mm -hmm. sent into the modern day and takes the modern day bath ideas back to rome and incorporates it and i play his friend marcus and one of the things he takes was like fruit milk and uh, they're talking about milk and like uh it's not scripted and i just said marcus likes his milkies <laughs> and and they kept the line in because they, they, everyone started laughing like hey we're keeping that you have to if someone's yeah. gonna say that yeah it was like because he likes his milkies it's like and it's like uh he doesn't say really anything important there he's like i like milk it's like i just, I just threw it out and it's like yeah we're keeping that and then at the end, when Lucius is running off, uh, Marcus and the sub is like, Lucius, wait, where are you going? And then I go, Lucius, where are you going? To get some more milk? <laughs> but yeah, one of my favorite things that I got to like ad lib in the booth that I thought was really funny. So good memories with that uh, show. In the, uh, in, the, in the heard it when I said it department, I was directing um, an actress by the name of Christina Kelly and a lot of times when the actor does a read, you know, the director is familiar with the show, so they know the context. So, you know, you, if they say um, something like, that never happened to me, and they go, that never happened to me, or, you know, whatever, you go, oh, that's not the right context. And we were, <laughs> we were sitting there talking, I was in the, and I wasn't even looking at her, I was just like going, hey, that was really good, Christina. Could you read that one more time, except this time I need you to go down on me. <laughs> Scratch that. What I mean is, I need you to not emphasize me, but I was, you know, when you say go down on a word or go up on a word, it just means give it more emphasis. So, anyway. wow. Fortunately, she was a good sport. I better hear that direction next time I work with you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got anything to say? Remember that one time Rico got stuck in the booth? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's always the one I tell because nothing that's ever happened to me can, can top that. He got stuck, like, Rico locked in. Rico legit uh, got locked in. I think the handle was screwed up. And so, like, you would turn it, you would do nothing, and the mechanism inside had already locked the door. So it was like, whee! I guess you're not coming out. <laughs> he was locked in the booth. It got hot in there. Yeah, they in had there. to call a locksmith. Yeah, he was in there, he was in there I remember seeing that, that tweet thread of yeah, him just he was progressing. Yeah, 
down and down and down his like depths of craziness. He like starts taking off his shirt. He's just in a tank top. He's sitting on his stool. Like, let me out. And it's it's a time. If you can find that tweet thread, you'll you'll see what Rico went through. It's like I think the he made it a Twitter of... moment. Like, so you can still find it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, a moment. That's better than anything that's ever happened to me. Not better, but a better <laughs> story. It's a better anecdote. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank that's you. Question, that was dude. a. We got a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah, we did. I wanted to ask a question as far as voice acting goes. Um, if you guys have ever gotten any one piece of advice from someone, or maybe mm-hmm. you have a piece piece of advice for someone that wants to get into voice acting or is interested in the field, anything that stuck with you, I'm just cur- Excuse me. Curious. Open to anyone. Uh, I think I have one. Uh, for a brief stint when I was uh, going to community college. Uh, I think Chris Rager went there for like a class or two and he did like, uh, he was in a production of a play. And uh, basically, and I was doing the theater department too, and I told him like, hey, hey, I got like my first audition at Funimation's, like got any advice for me? And brings me in close and says, don't F it up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, that's sound advice. Thank you, Mr. Rager. <laughs> but yeah, so that was my, my words of wisdom that I got from a professional. <laughs> and I don't think I messed it up because they're still uh, getting me into the booth. Or at least you don't know that you effed it up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one piece of advice that was sort of pseudo given to me through experience with uh, with some people that were in my circle, my social circle, as aspiring and or beginning actors, is like four, three, like three, four years back, um, was that don't use other people's success as a metric for where you should be. Um, because everybody, and everybody says this, but it's true. Everybody's journey is different. Every, some people are going to succeed very early on. Some people take a good while to succeed. Like, um, I think a good actor to use example is Ben Phillips. Ben Phillips has been in this game for a very, very, very long time. And he's mm-hmm. phenomenally talented. And it was only in the past couple of years, he started getting like bigger roles. And then he got cast as a, Rudius, or like the the actual Rudius in Mushoko Tensei, and he's phenomenal in it alongside Maddie Morris. So um, it, Ben's been at this for a long time. And then you have newer people like myself who have like are the fans turned professionals who want to do all this big stuff, but they look at you know like their peers or people who have been in this game a little bit longer than they have, and they're like, I want to do what they do. Why aren't I? Do- why aren't I doing it now? And they set a goal within a specific time frame, which you should never do because there's no guarantee about booking, like say you want to be in Dragon Ball, like, I'm going to be in Dragon Ball within a year. Well, that's a bad goal to place because, one, you should never put a time frame on that because you'll end up disappointing yourself if you don't do it within that year. And also, you shouldn't set time-centered goals in this sort of career because there you don't know if you're going to get those opportunities or not. So, but don't let others' successes and journeys influence you and what you think you should be at. And uh, it's good to be like optimistic and hopeful for, for more stuff and to want to work on more stuff, but just don't let that cloud um, what you've done and what you've been able to accomplish because the moment you start booking stuff, it's like, that's kind of cool. You've done a lot. You've done what some people wish they could be doing. So it's something to be grateful about. I'd say take classes. Chris Rager uh, does classes online, and his classes are really, really well received. Jose Sandoval is a, an engineer, and he does with different directors. Uh, goes through the dub uh, recording process with aspiring actors. Both of those are really sort of simple, easy ways to get your foot in the door, meet some other peers. Um, you know, and that the good thing about actors early on is we're very free with our information. Uh, we we tell each other where the where the auditions are, where where to find auditions. You know, everybody will, uh, you find a group of peers and they'll help you out for sure. I'm going to use some of, uh, well, not some of my time. I'm going to use my time to talk about this uh, because I think this is more beneficial than anything I can tell you in the next 45 seconds. If you want to do voice acting at some point in your life and you have a smartphone, take it out real quick. What you're going to want to do is type in I want to be a voice actor.com. Yep. And this is the splash page for it. This is what it looks like when you pop it up. Is Steve Bradley Baker's website, who's very, very professional, very, very good, and been doing stuff a long time. And it has. Five billion tons of inf- uh, pages of information, and uh, it's updated on the regular. And uh, I have gone through it uh, a few times, like I, because I recommend it to people. I'm like, I want to make sure that I'm not recommending them something that's lame. Uh, this site is super, super good. It talks about classes, it talks about equipment, it talks about a whole bunch of stuff. 
And um, I just want to make sure that as far as like a quick bit of information, I would like to pass that along because that has like tons of information. Yeah. So I want to be a voice actor.com. Please use that website. <laughs> um, there's, I recently, I was telling Chuck, I recently saw a video about becoming a voice actor that Bang <laughs> Zoom did. Okay. Like you're in it. Okay, so that was like 2003 or four. Yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. 20 years. And ago. and there, yeah, and there, it's very funny uh, because you, I knew the people in it, and and just the the axiom of uh, voice acting is what uh, they said down there is uh, the first thing you have to do is take acting classes um, because if you can't act, then you know going well, I can do a great. Blah 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 voice. And it's like, well, they've already got somebody to do blah blah blah, you know? So you want to take acting classes because the key to any good voiceover, whether you're doing anime or you're selling Coca Colas, is it has to sound authentic and real mm -hmm. and believable and not reading words from a page. And, and the only way you can get that is through acting. And, and um, to Rise Point, uh, you know, don't compare yourself to anybody else because. The most, the most important asset that you possess, uh, anybody wanting to do this, is that nobody has a voice exactly like yours. You, you and you alone possess that asset. So that's, your, that's a great strength, you know, but you want to use, learn how to use it. And it's like um, uh, people like go to that website and they, they'll come and they go, yeah, I want to be a voice actor and I just bought a, you know, blah, 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 foam and I've done my closet and I got a, Sennheiser mic, and I got a blah, 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 and I'm just like, really? Have you done any acting? No. Well, that to me is akin to like going, I'm gonna learn how to play the guitar. So I'm gonna go down to Guitar Center, and I'll buy a $2,000 Stratocaster, and a $1,000, uh, you know, amp, and a bunch of pedals, and a bunch of switches, and computer this and that, and get it all home, get it all set up, and it looks awesome. But you don't know how to play it. You know, you'd be better served by a $200 guitar, an acoustic, and learn how to play it because that's what's going to make a difference. So just the, the acting classes, I mean, you can learn all that valuable information Mike is talking about is absolutely true. Which and, also has acting class information. On exactly. I mean, it's just, yeah. and it's just, but that, there, there's, there's, there's like really not that many things to do, but, and I've just learned watching that video, talking to other actors, and you realize that, yeah, this is what I'm saying is the truth, and it's what they're all everyone's saying. It's the same thing. So just, uh, but the, and then the other great piece of advice I would give is start. Yep. You know, it's like you don't ever have to ask this question to any other actor again. Right. You you you've got all. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've got the answers. So it's just a matter of going to do it. So. Um, since that website covers so much of the concrete technical information. I'm going to tell you something that I've learned, um, which is that like when we get this question at conventions, it's usually from people who like anime and are anime fans and want to be voice actors. Maybe not just because they like anime. Maybe you do have a passion for acting. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the fact that anime is a passion and a hobby for so many people that go into voice acting, um, I think it sets you up for a lot of grief um, because it's, it's the thing you love, right? Um, so if, if, you, if you do pursue a career in voice acting or in acting, um, that, is so f that career is so full of rejection um, and competition, and uh, you're going to have dry spells, you're going to have slow spells, you're going to not book anything for months or a year or years. Um, and so my advice is to always have something that you're passionate about that you can put your energy into that is not anime and not video games. Um, play music, you know, garden. <laughs> um, hang out with people who are outside of your, like have a, a friend group who supports you and loves you and wants to see you succeed that is not in your industry it's totally fine to hang out with you know we're all friends but like it's if you're constantly immersed in in the career you want and you're going through a slow spell it can be really tough on your mental health so you know pursue it but don't sell your soul to it yep sweet really good information i appreciate 
all the stuff you guys had to add. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. That's a good one. Okay, so I'd like to ask a question about your guys' opinion because it's a one-piece panel. Uh, sure. Who would win in a fight? Luffy uh. versus Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star. Luffy. <laughs> the guy's made of rubber. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. made of rubber. Kenshiro he can't do win, crap. But he won't lose. Yeah. If anything, it's a stalemate. Yeah. But I, I hands down believe Luffy would win. I mean, I, you see what he can do, right? For most things... The answer is Luffy is, is going to win in a fight. <laughs> he, he's that new gear. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because yeah. because every time you think they're like, well, there's no way out of this situation. Like, oh, okay, well now he doesn't. Now he's in space and he doesn't have to breathe. And there's this and this and he's super strong in this and we've solved that. I'm like, cool. Well, then it's still Luffy then, right? Yeah. One hundred percent Luffy. Yes. Luffy's just OP. Kenshiro is OP in his universe. Yeah. But but Luffy. Luffy's basically like a god, dude. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with Crocodile. That's <laughs> <I didn't> <laughs> Wasn't even an option, but I'm going with that one. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, thanks, thank you for answering uh, my question. Thank you, of course, dude. Thanks for the question. All right. First off, I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for what you guys do. Aw. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Like, it's, you entertain me in my life, and I'm sure for them as well. Uh, Toonami. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Second, though, just a fun question. I asked this before to Ian on the last seminar or the last panel. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys like to prank people? Um, depends on what context and what situation is. I will definitely like pretend to be like a kid whose mom isn't home. Sorry. On sales calls. Oh, on sales calls. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't. I don't. I don't know how to use a computer. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I, Monica would tell me stories of her doing that too. Like the people would call, like you know, is there, is there an adult home? Like, it's Grandpa, but he won't wake up. He's in the tub, and I don't know what's happening. Grandpa. Oh no. Yeah, she would yeah, just take it to it. Like, yeah. Well, are you authorized to make a financial decision? <laughs> yeah. Get mommy's credit card. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do recently is that, uh, for context, I stream. Um, what I By like to do. Men and- <laughs> I like to I like to do Carl Weezer's voice to people. Yeah. So I'll be like, "Hi guys, what's up?" Yeah. And I'll say the stupidest crap in that voice, and it gets people to like squirm because they they hate it. So I'll be like, "Yeah, I love llamas, but I also like a bit of it. or something like that." And I just screw around with that. So I like to screw around with people with that. Um, but I sh- I should do that to a scam caller at some point. I think that'd be hilarious. I, I think Rob Paulson would be proud of you. <laughs> uh, I don't think I necessarily prank people with my talents. I do like to prank other people who I work with all the time that are talented. So yeah, that, that does true. happen to be my friends. So, But I, I, like, I like doing a goof with my buds. The best feeling is whenever you get to record something that's funny, like in the script that's funny and you record before a friend and you're like, I can't wait for them to just burst out laughing and just lose all character. It's some of the, when I was recording a few episodes of Prince of Tennis, uh, uh, there's a gag episode where everybody's chibi, and I got to record before a lot of people, and I got to see the chaotic writing process to make everything funny. So as we were writing everything, we were just dying of laughter and just waiting for people to <laughs> to listen to everything. And uh, I know whenever somebody does something really, really funny, I'll just burst out laughing and break character. But we just go back in to do it. But it's always fun whenever you get to actually record something funny before somebody else, and they can just have a good laugh about it, either you know as they're recording it or afterwards. I think I'm usually the one getting pranked. Sorry, go ahead. What? Oh no, I was just saying. No, I am no prankster. No pranks. One time, a long time ago, before the like years and years ago, I would never ever do this now. Okay, but. What you in. do? I would. I swear. I. Uh, it I was... slashed tires at the parking lot. <laughs> Yeah, where's my money for that, by the way? Uh, you weren't born yet. I'm just kidding. Hey, I might be the youngest person on this panel, but that hurts. No, I'm just oh kidding. Oh, my God. Um, one time I went into a panel or into a session with a little bit of a sniffle. Again, I wouldn't do that now because we're living in a post world. But at the time, I was like, oh, I got a little bit of a sniffle today. I'm not feeling too good. I was recording at Sentai um, mm-hmm. with Kyle and Ricardo. Mm-hmm. Um, Ricardo Contreras is like an amazing godlike engineer. Um, and I was recording Brynhildr in the darkness, and I was sniffly, and there was like 
mucus like in the like the back of my sinuses i don't know mm-hmm. and it, it it sounded like that and it was like under the line and ricardo sampled it and played it back like a dubstep song every time he was trying to play me in <laughs> And it took a really long time to get through that scene because it just sounded like <laughs> Skrillex, snot, snot Skrillex. <laughs> so I got pranked, but I don't mm-hmm. usually do the pranking. Uh, John and, and Mike and Chuck, I mean, you guys were talking about being in on the ground floor when, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 40s, so remembering when anime, what we used to call it Japanese animation back then, it wasn't all shortened down to one word, mm-hmm. when it became very, very popular all of a sudden, that just that rocket shot up. I mean, being on the ground floor back then and getting used to the business and then having someone uh, like Rai come in, again, being the youngest gentleman on the stage, thank you, uh, is, it, is, it, is it kind of rewarding to see that this is where it's gone and getting people that are choosing this as a career to come in and, and kind of follow in your footsteps? First, the first time I was cast, I didn't know anything about uh, anything and it seemed like a scam. Cause like Chris Sabat like ripped a piece of notebook paper out and like put your address down so I can pay you and I'm like, this is not how auditions work. <laughs> but then like the second when DB Super came out was when like the really big sort of second wave hit, and then we were really exciting to have these these characters come back and to see the whole fandom had opened up to pretty much the whole world was was sort of a it was a wild ride for a while for sure. Um. I mean, I mean, yes, it's cool. I, I don't, I guess I don't look at it that way as far as like, uh, like I do think like kind of somewhat level ground floor. Like I always throw in like, 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 I mean, I'm, I wasn't in Speed Racer or Battle of the Planets or stuff right, that came right, before, right, right. but yeah. like there's other stuff. There's other like big instances like, you know, like Pokemon and when Dragon Ball and Pokemon and Digimon and those sort of things hit. So yeah, I mean, I, I get that. But to me, I, and I realize that it is a, a newer type of uh, art form for the thing but to me it's just like it's like movies or theater or whatever like uh, there is always going to be new people that come in and part of the reason that they want to come in is because, like like if it's movies is because they love watching movies they love you know they they either want to be someone on screen or they want to be someone behind the camera or someone else wherever along the way there's an excitement to it uh, for media and for storytelling and for art and for whatever else that excites you that will inspire you to go out and do something else. So um, I, I do think that when, when, you know, like we've had a couple of questions about it in the panel today about like, you know, getting started in it or whatever. I do think that's neat. I don't necessarily like, I guess, put it on me is the way I was like, kind of felt like it. I think that it just happens all over the world and I'm getting to witness some of it, yeah. if that makes sense. I, I will say, um, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we weren't in on the ground floor. Like they didn't come to us and go, hey, this is called anime. No one's ever done it. We're gonna, do, you know. But I created post-its. Right. But <laughs> but we we were in when. I mean, I, I give you a great analogy. Take paper and glue. When we started doing it, there might be one or two conventions a month somewhere. Now there's six and seven a week somewhere, mm-hmm. and and not just 500 kids here and a thousand kids here. There's 8,000 people coming this weekend. And 10,000 at that show and 5,000 at that show. And this show does have 500, but it's in, you know, some little bitty town or something. And just the, I mean, and I know that um, all of us have run into this, but I mean, stuff like at the airport. I was flying in last night and this lady at the airport in Houston goes, why are you going to Sacramento? And I said, well, I'm going to an anime convention. Oh, my son loves anime. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I don't know anything about it. I said, well, text your son and tell him that you're talking to all for one and see what, just see what happens. <laughs> so we land in Sacramento, meet again at, she goes, oh, oh, come here. And we're at baggage claim. <laughs> Look what my son said. And it's just, oh my God, you know, and, and it, you know, that's, I mean, that's very touching. And that's, it's cool that it, um, it reaches that many people. And uh, it's, it's cool that it's, because it's becoming so popular, it's becoming more respected by the entertainment industry in general. I mean, it used to be like, oh, you do anime, that's so good. One day when you grow up to be a real voice actor. Oh my God. And it's like, you know, okay, that's fine for you. That's good. And, um, you know, good luck with you. But it's, it's something that's very real and, and it touches a lot of people. And it's, um, 
it's very humbling, but it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to know that we've all been part and we are all part of this thing that is still growing. I mean, it's still getting bigger and bigger. So it's, um, it's really cool. And it is, you know, my daughter now, she's 21 and graduating from college with a degree and uh, she started doing anime and just actually got in with some stuff at Funimation and now and um, you know I'm just it's really cool like we do some conventions together and we do a father-daughter panel like you know different generations of, of doing this so it's um, it, it is it's kind of it's pretty neat pretty neat to, to give my perspective as like a fan turned professional um, it, it's it's really cool to be able to to growing up with so many people like that I watched like I watched like you three especially I grew up watching a lot of your stuff and your performances and you know it, it was inspirational to me to get me to this point um, which is you know why I wanted to become a voice actor and just act in general because I wanted to be able to touch people like them and as many other professionals I grew up with did with me when I was growing up because I didn't have the best upbringing um, and so to be able to work alongside some of these people I grew up watching and, you know, uh, look to for, like, inspiration, both acting and professionalism, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool um, to be able to work along, alongside a lot of really cool people and to... to it is. It is really cool. <laughs> oh, stop. Um, but, yeah, it's really cool because the whole way in which people can start off to start voice acting has changed dramatically than how it used to be, like... 10, 15 years ago, um, because now the internet exists, and I and I'm many of the big, the newer big name voice actors like your Howard Wangs, Alejandro Sobs, uh, even Chris here, we, we got our start online. We did a lot of indie projects, fan projects, stuff like that, and, and we just kept doing it because we liked it. We grew up watching anime and playing video games, and we, we really liked it and wanted to be in it. And now we're here, and it's kind of surreal sometimes. <laughs> so, Aww. thank you. But yeah. That's my sappy moment for the convention. Oh. Pokemon suit. Oh, that's a sick suit. Oh, my yeah. God. Thank you. I appreciate it. That is a pretty it. awesome suit. <laughs> no, uh, I had a, it was wondering, because, you know, there's some animes like One Piece that's now, like, out of 1,000 episodes or whatever. Beyond. So, like, I was wondering how you guys feel about, like, the characters you play. Like, is there a, a part where you want them to keep going on forever for your characters kind of thing? Or is there a part where, like, it starts to get a little stale or that you just kind of want to start working on another project. Like, I just want to know how you feel about your personal characters. I'm sure that you, like, take them on as, like, your own at this point when you, you know, they start coming out there, so. Uh, to, to be honest, for me, it's, uh, I'm always, I'm, you know, I'm happy to, that anybody has chosen me to do anything as yeah. far as, like, auditions and roles and that sort of stuff go. So I always love acting. I love working with, with the, like, as far as in, in One Piece, the main character I have is Buggy, as far as, like, like the main job would be like that I am the ADR voice director for a bunch of it, but my main acting job in it would be Buggy. Uh, I'll can, I love the character of Buggy. I love any time he pops up on screen. I think it's so wonderful. If Buggy's, you know, um, place in the story at some point ceases to exist and, and like it comes to an ending and, and there's no more Buggy, whatever, uh, then, the, then I will have been happy to have been able to do that all myself and like been able to have uh, made that accomplishment of like, I did all of Buggy, all that the Buggy exists is great. Um, uh, I can always audition for more things and I want more things, uh, but I don't want to, I don't want my character to go on for just for the sake of my own personal happiness, I guess is what I'm saying. A paycheck is nice, but also the art, the artist side of me is like, I want this character to have their arc and to have their concrete end. If they come back, cool! If not, they were around. It was fun. Like, if Pika came back, I'd frankly be shocked. But yeah. I would have a blast, because I get to do the crazy voice again. I'm sorry, the manly voice again. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, like... Yeah, I, I, another show I work on is uh, Attack on Titan, and I've had so many people come up like, you know, wouldn't you want it to go on forever? Wouldn't you want it to do something? Like, well, the story ends, and I don't want to cheat the story. I don't want there to be like the equivalent of like CSI Miami or something, <laughs> except that it's AOT. Like, yeah. that's the story, and it should come to an end. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And the cool thing about One Piece is that Oda will bring back, like, he'll bring back characters that haven't showed up in, you know, years. 300 chapters. Oh, yeah, yeah, years. Moji, um, for instance. I really think Baby Five is going to come back but th I won't spoil anything. <laughs> this time, it's personal. <laughs> no. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Well, uh, just uh, any time you're cast, you know, uh, uh, some somewhat related or similar thing would be, do you hate being typecast? And and the answer is no, because you're being cast, and and you try to bring something unique and different to every performance, no matter what you're doing. But, you know, if they brought back Crocodile or you know, uh, Dodoria cracks me up because if this were live action, it'd be like great because Dodoria's always seems to be in the background, doesn't say anything. So for voiceover, that didn't really work well for me. You know, it's like, he's there, he just doesn't say anything. So and there's always a, a little anecdote that uh, Chris Ayers used to always do, and he'd go, I'd go into work for him, and he'd like, John, come, walk with me. Huh. And we'd sit down, and he'd smoke a cigarette or two and drink this massive Coca-Cola, and he goes, so I'm watching this show, and I, I just, I saw this one character, and uh, I just thought, oh my gosh, God, there's only one person that can do that. There's only one, he'd he doesn't say a whole lot, but man, he's in like everything. He's always there. I'm like, great, man. What's his name? Soldier B. <laughs> I'm the one you thought of. Yeah, you're going to kill it. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah. And it comes to One Piece. Yeah, I've, uh, I've loved the characters I played, though I feel a little spoiled because I've gotten to play three very vastly different characters uh, personality wise. So. Uh, Gecko Moria, vastly different from Peckham's, uh, then uh, Haruden, just a, a warrior giant. So it's oh, it's been nice to be able to you know have my time with them and then like let go and be like, oh, we got a new uh, flavor for you to try. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, but it's uh, I have, it's been amazing to like kind of have that uh, kind of whiplash of changing gears. Like, okay, we got this different character for you, uh, completely different from what you did before. It's like, all right, I'm game. And I want to throw props just because you brought that up. Uh, the reason he's able to do that and he comes in auditions for things because this dude over here is really awesome. Yeah, he's so talented. He's really, really good. He can switch from one thing to another. You, unless you're like sitting there watching him, you don't know necessarily that it's the same person doing these different voices. Christopher Guerrero is very, very, very good. And I want to make sure, oh, you guys know it. Yay, Christopher Guerrero. Yeah, oh, he's so awesome good. Chris. Yeah, the, the big, having more than one big role in One Piece, because I was like, ah, someone was that, you know, we had this person in and they did this character like 50 or 100 or 200 episodes ago. I'm trying to like, you know, like it doesn't matter if it's Christopher Guerrero because I'm like, oh, well, then it's it's just going to be completely different anyway because Christopher Guerrero comes in and delivers neat stuff all the time. So I try my best, but a good direction too and a guidance helps a lot. And good scripts. And good scripts. Yeah. 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 And good. Go team. Yes. And good drink. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. My question for you guys is, um, you know, growing up, you, you know, everyone has these magazines, toys. How do you guys feel that, like, you're, you know, embracing these characters that now have, like, action figures, merchandise, movies? Like, how does that make you feel to be in that position and be like, oh, my God, like, I voiced this character. And, you know, there's a little action figure. Like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I just want to know, like, your guys' reactions to, like, the merchandise you guys, you know. Are the voices behind? It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's cool. It's cool as hell, man. I was uh, in a Target, the first Garlic Jr. Uh, character came out, and there's a little kid who went like, Garlic Jr., and I came up behind him, and I was like, I'm gonna push you into the dead zone! And his mom was confused. Um, Security was called. <laughs> but it was funny, I explained it to her, and then, but that was, that was one moment where I got to, one of the first moments I got to be like, Aww. the voice character in the real world. That's wholesome. Yeah. Um, the uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I was going to say, uh, I'll, make, I'll try to make this quick. So uh, I did a show called Soul Leader. And um, my son, I walked into his room one day, and he was on his phone. And uh, I go, what are you doing? He's like, watching anime. I go, really, what are you watching? Soul Leader. Oh, you know, your dad plays Lord Death. And he goes, yeah, I'm watching the Japanese version. <laughs> That's disrespectful. And I was like, get out. He goes, Grounded. He goes, well, this is my room. And I'm like, no, get out of my house. I'm I, you know. room out. Yeah. So conversely... Uh, one of my most favorite roles is a movie Mike directed me in called The Boy and the Beast. Oh, yeah. And uh, I play the Beast, and it's a beautiful, beautiful movie by Momoro Hosada. And um, we went to go see, at the Alamo Draft House, we went to go see a screening of it because they had a little theatrical run for it. And um, uh, I took my family, and there was a crowd about this big, you know, and at the end of the movie, we're all applauding and crying and laughing, and we all walk out kind of in a throng of people, and I'm in the middle of it, and my 
10-year-old daughter at the time is holding my hand, and as she walks out, she goes, Daddy, you were awesome as the voice of the beast. And everyone goes, what? And, you know, flips around, like, you're John Swayze. I was like, yeah. And like, oh, my God. They start flipping out, and they want autographs and pictures and all this. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is so nice. Thank you all. And I looked at my son, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> So to, to, to be in these characters and to do this stuff that, again, what I was saying earlier goes back to see the figures and images and all kinds of stuff that you've done and help make this what it is, is it is a good feeling, for sure. I like to collect when I can, but it seems with characters I voice, there's a great divide. Either I can get them as like a nice cheap keychain, or they're a hundred plus dollars. I'm just oh, like, yeah. hmm, I don't know if I can justify spending $400 on this figurine. It looks very nice, but that's a lot of money that I could use for uh, uh, some uh, for, bills. For not bills, figurines. Good food, yeah. Yeah. Um, vacation time. Yeah. So what you need to do is go by his table and buy like 30 items. Yeah. So then he can go buy it. the figurine. Yes. Especially like for one, some One Piece characters, the figures are pretty cool, but they are expensive. Yeah, like yeah. P.O.P. brand. Woo. They're great, oh, yeah. look beautiful, but they expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I was much like Chuck, like because uh, we, we probably got figures about the same time yeah. as far as like things that we have worked on and suddenly it has an action figure. That was very cool. Um, I will say, as, as what you were just describing, it can be a bottomless pit of like, you know, you, you get to a point, if you're fortunate enough to continue to work on things that have that much merch, where you have to go, I need like a storage space or a bigger house, or I need to be more selective, like what you yeah. were saying with more selective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what, what's cool beyond that is even if I don't buy anything like it's so cool that if anyone wants that that it's out there and that may not have been the case 20 30 years ago for sure mm -hmm. for this particular type of medium in in this country so that's awesome yeah yeah, yeah. definitely lots more imports lots more stuff yeah. <laughs> you know. well uh, thank you so much for your time thank you thank you thank you, thank you guys for the good questions well, I do think that is all the time we have for it. Thank you so much, everybody. Christopher, Rye, Chuck, Mike, John, Caitlin. Thank you so much for being at our show.